In this episode of Filter and Views, I'm talking to bassist, composer, and visual artist Damon Banks. We met about 12 years ago, and since then, I had the chance to play in some of his own projects. In 2017, he joined Filtronam at the Jazz Mandu Festival in Nepal and will be on the upcoming album TransitNet. He talks about bass players that influenced him, the New York scene, and some of his tours and travels in the 80s and 90s. You know, within the last 20, 30 years, traveling became easier. Being in a city like New York, you play with so many people. I'm a little bit concerned for the younger generations, not only to be able to do that, but to see the value and the importance of that. Absolutely. Because so much, especially now, is being done remotely. There's not much direct interaction playing together. And I really hope that this is not going to be the beginning of a whole new way of making music where there is this element of human connection is actually being removed. When you talk about being mentored by masters, whether you're being mentored by a master musician and you're able to go to live events, jam sessions, whatever, See your teachers at work, have them work with you, and then you having a, um, an environment for you to experiment. That was already dwindling. And then now, with the loss of contact, I mean, what if you're in a dance company or what if you're in a theater company? Any art form that involves collaboration had to be reimagined at this point. Across the board, people have had to take a step back and say, well, how can I achieve my goals with this new reality? Because I'm in a collaborative art form, and um, it, in order to accomplish any of these projects, you have to be able to, to be involved with people, not only on a Zoom level, but in person. So, you know, we, you know we're live musicians and we, we gravitate towards improvisational music and collaborative music and exchanging of ideas. That's kind of really what it's all about, you know. Let's get back where, to the beginning of, of your story, where, where you come from and how it all started for you with, with bass playing and, and music in general. And I always consider myself a late bloomer when it comes to certain things. When my brother played he started playing bass when I was in junior high school, but we were both artists. We, we drew, we did cartoons, we were sketching, we did painting and everything. So we did both. Growing up in New York, I was exposed to pretty much every style of music imaginable. But when I connected myself to music was really when I got to junior high school and I was like, you know, sixth, seventh grade. And I didn't connect with any bass players specifically until the virtuosos started to emerge in my life. I was always influenced already influenced by James Jameson, but didn't know it because I didn't know he played all, in all the Motown stuff. So he was probably the most important bass player in my life. My brother, you know, he brought home a Stanley Clark record. I think it was Stanley first that, that said, wow, and, you know, I, I didn't know that you could really do that on bass because I never saw somebody step out that aggressively and, and with that kind of form. So when he started getting into fusion around the early 70s, he brought home Weather Report, Mysterious Traveler. You know, I just kind of like started to get into Alfonso Johnson. And then once I got turned on to George Duke and then Alfonso Johnson was also playing with George Duke, I said, well, wait a minute, that's that's like my favorite player. But once Jocko took over for Alfonso, <laughs> just like with Stanley, it was so unreachable to me. Like I heard the Jocko solo record before I really knew Black Market. And the Jocko solo record was something that was like unimaginable as a bass player. I didn't know that anyone could ever do anything like that. You know, so you got those three, you know, Alfonso, Stanley, Jocko. And then later on, funny, Robbie Shakespeare, you know, because my mother's side is Jamaican. Aside from Family Man Barrett, you know, Rob, Robbie Shakespeare is like the virtuoso genius of reggae bass. I mean, him and Sly, they, they were like the Tony Williams and Ron Carter of reggae. Like they did things that were never done before. They generated styles of Jamaican music, dance music, just by them two playing, like they created different styles of reggae music and Jamaican music. And so that's when I got to, you know, started really focusing on reggae, you know, when I was a little older. I mentioned the art part because I went to music and art high school as an art major. I had my portfolio, I got in, but I knew I wanted to be involved in music, but I couldn't take music because they wouldn't let you switch over. So when I got into school, you know, Marcus and uh, Omar Hakim, they were all seniors when I got to music and art high school. I remember one day I went to, um, I had art class and, you know, uh, I, said, I said, let me get a, um, a bathroom pass. I just want to go to the bathroom. So I snuck upstairs and I heard the, the gospel band playing, you know, and it was funky as hell. I was like, man, this band is killing. Me. And I went upstairs and I looked through the window and, you know, Marcus was playing bass and Omar was playing drums. And I said, wow, man, you know, these, these guys are incredible. So then the next day I had an art class. I got a, a bathroom pass. I said, well, let me go to the bathroom. So they let me go. And I snuck upstairs again. 
and the jazz band was playing. So I looked at the window, and it was Marcus again, but it was Kenny Washington on drums. So I was like, wait a minute, man. This guy Marcus is like, he's, you know. And he wasn't even a bass major. He was a clarinet major, you know. But So that was, being in that environment, you always had something to reach for and, you know, people to, and to inspire you. I was frustrated for a long time that I wasn't able to take music in music and art, but being an artist made me, I think, a better musician, you know, because the things you learn as a visual artist, you can always apply to other disciplines. So, you know, there are things about layering, using one color in a whole painting to, to give it continuity, foreshadowing, background, um, how to emphasize different things on a sketch. You can use all of that in music. You can also use all of those elements in film, you know, because that's why the arts are so connected, because they all have the same kind of energy and you can manipulate all the elements. You know, you can do an improvisational painting with no preparation. You can do a careful oil painting where you do, you know, the thumbnail sketch. Those things were valuable because they helped me make, I think, better choices as a musician, you know, when I'm approaching music. And so that was high school. I went to college for music at Fisk University, which is where John Lewis went. It was an all-black college in Nashville, which was an interesting experience to go from New York, which was totally multicultural, to all that college, you know. It was a shock to the system, but it was it was important because I didn't know a lot about my own African-American culture at that time, you know. So once I graduated, I just decided to do music full-time. Freelancing in, in New York during the 80s was amazing because, you know, I, I was able to, like, work every night I wanted to work, you know. The early 90s was when all these African gigs started to pop up. There was a lot of clubs that were that would devote nights to West African music, you know, North African, Maghreb, Moroccan things. So I met Kofo back then, you know, um, Jojo and all those guys, Martino and, you know, Dominic. I was thinking about the different styles of music that emerged in my lifetime that I was either, you know, a witness of or participating in. And, you know, I remember when growing up in the Bronx, like we never thought, like hip hop didn't have a name. It was called B-boy music, you know, and the B-boys were the guys who would, and girls who would just dance, you know, break dancing and all that stuff. And Grandmaster Flash, he was from my neighborhood and everything. So I didn't reject the music, but it was just like neighborhood music. I was like, ah, if I want to hear that stuff, I'll go downstairs and go to the park, you know. I didn't disrespect it, but it wasn't anything that we thought was beyond our neighborhood. Plus, you couldn't go to the clubs because there were really not many girls going to the clubs. I wanted to be around older women, and they were in the disco clubs, so we would go to disco clubs. But the hip-hop stuff was a little too, a little too thuggish for me. I was like, you know. It was great to see that emerge because the creativity of the neighborhood generated its own music. All these different styles, like even different forms of dance music would happen in certain clubs in New York. And I was getting in those clubs in college, places like Studio 54 and the Paradise Garage. And I started touring with guys like George Howard and Alex Bunyon and you know, do shows with Najee. And finally, after working with, the, with Hassan, who was with Peter Gabriel's label, all these African artists or well, artists from around the world had a forum and had a platform. Being able to tour with Peter... I felt so much freedom. I said, wow, this is this is a perfect world now because all of these folks have a label and have uh, support and can share the music around the world. And then mixing all of these styles, you know, we would do shows with Trans Global Underground and Natasha Atlas, you know, we would all hang out, Ja Wobble, and these folks. And like, they were young. We were all young. You know, it was like, Blue Swat did uh, the other half of the tour that we did. As during certain days, you realize that you were, um, you were surrounded by very um, open-minded people Therefore, it was easy to absorb things because you weren't around narrow-minded kind of energy. And then, you know, one of the tours that I did in the 90s was with Arlo Lindsay and Ambitious Lovers, you know, Peter Scherer. And I never knew that you could do that kind of stuff. You know, even after all the music I had been doing prior to that, I never worked with noise. You know, I never worked with, like, <laughs> I never worked with, you know, any kind of avant-garde elements or stuff that was just sound-generated mixed with Portuguese, you know, bossa nova, mixed with, like, slamming, noisy. I went to Brazil in 87, and it really blew my mind because I was there for two months, and I I never... The only Brazilian music I really I was able to identify before that was, like, Flora and Aerto, and, and, you know, I heard Milton Nascimento, but it was kind of tangential. I didn't know Native Dance or nothing like that, but when I went to Brazil, I was in Rio for two months, and I got to see Ivan Lins doing club gig, like a, a bar gig. 
got to see Milton's 25th anniversary tour in Javon. I saw him in the grocery store. I'm in Brazil. I don't even think about America now. I just don't want to leave, you know? So, you know, there again, here's another country, as you know better than I do. It's just like kind of, once you crack a door open, then it becomes like a whole nother planet of amazing, just gifted artistry and all these amazing contributions to the creative world. And um, so my theory is that the, the music that I dig the most, they come from conflict, you know, they come from cultures that clash and have kind of complicated histories. But out of the conflict and out of the horror and the pain come the beauty. But the yeah. depth of the music comes from the pain and suffering. So when you think about, you know, Andalusia, you know, the mixture of cultures in southern Spain and the mix of cultures in Brazil, the mix of cultures in uh, you know, North Africa to New Orleans, you know, anything in America, you have this kind of juxtaposition of pain and suffering, but also hope and love. Whether it's the blues or whether it's, you know, Bayon or the flamenco, it's the places that have the complexity that usually generate some some of the most rich and interesting music. And um, so I, I noticed, you know, and even the Caribbean, like there's a lot of uh, complicated stories in the Caribbean. And when you think about zouk and reggae and merengue, and calypso, it has it in there, it pulls you in. You're like, why am I so drawn to it? It's because it's very human. 